Hey, it's Debbie, and I am excited to share with you a guest I wanted on. Well, last couple of years, I met him or listened to him present at the Idea World Fitness Convention that was in LA last year. And two weeks ago, I saw him again and loved, 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 loved what he was talking about last year. is about metabolic testing, zone two, hit training, but research based and he is huh, since Fabio Camana and he's got a NASM CPT CES a PES a CNC CWC ACE CPT HC CSCS ACSM EP CISSN <laughs> like I just said the alphabet so I had him come on the show because he was talking this year let me go to my slides Muscle development, muscle development, the science and strategies to building muscle was one of the seminars. And then he was talking about training over 40. So let me bring him in. He's in the room. So hold on and I'll push. All right. We're going to talk about my favorite topics, how to age gracefully, get stronger as we age is my goal. So Fabio, thank you for making time. I know you're super busy and you are working all the time and just keeping us up to date on science. So I thought you were the man to talk to about science and development of muscles and improving our health as we age, as we strive to be fit and healthy from the inside out. So you're on, on the right channel to share your <laughs> information you take to us individuals all over. Well, thanks for inviting me, Demi. Appreciate it. Now, tell us a little bit about what you do for a living and your why. My why? Well, what I do is <laughs> I, I'm faculty at San Diego State University, so I teach in our exercise and nutritional sciences, and I teach courses in exercise physiology. I've got, you know, we cover, <laughs> you know, kines, um nutrition, stuff like that, and then I teach a programming class where we take people, students, our students from corrective exercise to Olympic lifting. I also teach a behavioral modification class and I teach an exercise and aging class. I kind of got my hands full there. And then of course, involved in all sorts of projects at the university. And then, you know, I consult outside of the university. I kind of stay hopefully well embedded in the fitness industry where I have, you know, I'm, a, I'm on advisory boards for, for example, Orange Theory. Um, I'm a you know subject matter expert for the National Academy of Sports Medicine, and I have partnerships with other educational companies where I'm involved in either building content for them or disseminating the science that's out there so that they can have hopefully practical applications to their members and their their audience. Mm -hmm. And then for fun, I just try and keep myself out of trouble and keep myself upright and moving. Keeping upright. We'll talk about that aging. And as we were talking before we hit record about our parents and aging and movement and socialization. So you talked two really seminars that were my favorite at the Idea World Fitness Convention, fueling and training over 40, as we're usually all our listeners, I think, have been with me. I've had this podcast 12 years. So now we're suddenly not just 40, but in our 50s. And then muscle development, really focusing as we age, how to avoid the stereotype, I'm going to get puffy, fat, slow, sluggish, poor recovery, you know, what can we do to get stronger as we age and prevent that muscle loss? Sure. You know, well, uh, you know, that's kind of a loaded question, but let's try and kind of mm -hmm. peel it away with a few layers there. So first of all, the good news is that, you know, the ability to build muscle can happen at any age, right? albeit slower as we get older, because our anabolic pathways, our hormonal responses, everything is kind of much like an older car. It just doesn't function as efficiently as it did when it was younger. So, you know, for example, look at testosterone levels in a 25-year-old versus a 55-year-old, right? Significantly different. But there is still the opportunity to build muscle mass, you know, at any age. And we see studies mm -hmm. in people even in their 90s who are capable of building muscle mass. So I don't think we should, you know, jump ship and kind of give up on you know, resistance training where we are subscribing to overload, right? But I think we also have to appreciate that, you know, we've got to be realistic about things and we're not going to build muscle at the same rate, nor are we going to recover and adapt at the same rates. And I think that's a big part that's missing. You know, in that yeah. session that you mentioned that we did at IDEA, you know, 
I kind of kicked off with just kind of a, a you know, an icebreaker where I said, hey, do you remember these folks? And I threw a bunch of pictures of, you know, the fitness icons of the 80s and 90s. And then I also threw on, up on the slide a bunch of the mantras that we had, that we lived through in the 80s and 90s, which, you know, you know, pain is weakness leaving your body, no pain, no gain, you know, and a lot of us trained that way. We were ruthless. We were relentless. And look where we are today. You know, most of us are paying for it. Unfortunately, maybe not in the best way. Uh, the smart ones have survived that, but some of the other ones like myself, we are paying the price of it, right? And then I think, you know, we're also, you know, clinging onto this, this idea of this, you know, this aesthetic that we want, that we've always had in our 20s and 30s. And the reality is the physiology of, our, of the human body, you know, once we kind of, it becomes most noticeable in the 40s, you know, hormonal changes happen, you know, kind of for men, for example, in their, you know, sort of mid 20s, we start to see the first evidence of testosterone decline. But the, the physical manifestation of that doesn't really start to happen until about the 40s. And that's when we're like, oh, what the hell's going on? And for ladies, obviously, they've got their, you know, menopause going into pre, you know, peri and, and menopause and then postmenopause. And so there's this change happening at our age that, you know, that we're talking about. And frankly, we're not happy about it, right? We don't want to, you know, kind of concede and, you know, acknowledge the reality of our changing body. So what do we do? We get more desperate and we go crazier and we kind of obsess. And then of course, what our bodies don't do is they just don't recover. And we see tons of evidence of people, you know, living in discomfort, living in pain, overtraining, and we just got to be realistic about things. So I think, you know, great topic that you're having. Let's talk about what, what we can do as a person in their forties and fifties. I'm not just going to say train hard, but to train smart. I think that's what we need to start thinking about is now the game has changed. Now we should all be looking at our longevity, right? You know, we talked about our parents. You know, we want, much like our parents, we want to live a long but functional and fruitful life. And you can't do it if you're hurt and you're immobilized, right? So this is the time where I think we still have time to do it. You know, younger generations are learning the science that we didn't know 20, 30 years ago, and they can do it at an earlier age. But for us in our 40s and 50s, it's not too late. We can start to learn how to make these necessary changes so that we can train smart and enjoy those, you know, those 70s and 80s and who knows beyond living functionally, independently and also enjoying life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I would say. Don't blame the aging process, but embrace the change and adapt and shift tower training as I did Ironmans and marathons, 50K trail runs for a long time. I got broken adrenal exhaustion, whatever it was, I tell everyone about age 42. <laughs> so 10 years later, you know, I've just been dealing with how to be my best self and live my best life, doing what you love to do, but doing it smarter, not training harder, but we have to adapt. And then looking at, you know, genetics and my recovery is different. And really looking at what I should do now is going to be different than when I was 40. So I'm, I'm all about that. <laughs> yeah. Where, you know, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, just like go ahead where you want to start with what we should start well, with. Well, I mean, you know, let's talk about training, intensity, training frequency. I guess we could start there, then we can kind of include fueling and we can talk about, you know, recovery and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, what we're seeing with research is pretty interesting that, you know, um, a few years ago, some researchers did a, a, you know, kind of a systematic review of all the literature that's out there. And they gave us some input. And that's what I shared in that session at IDEA. And they were talking about, you know, how much training do we need to do to actually see growth of muscle, right? And what's interesting is, you know, we have this thing called the stimulus adaptation recovery, uh, stimulus recovery adaptation cycle, right? That was created many years ago. And we've always lived by this mantra that, you know, you should target a muscle group, you know, every 48 to 72 hours. Right. I mean, that's kind of you, know, you talk to people in the gym like, hey, if I'm training my chest and I want to you know, develop some strength in my chest or maybe some size in my chest or my biceps, whatever group we want to talk about, how frequently should I train? And, you know, it's always been kind of that that kind of almost that belief system in the gym. Well, you know, every 48 to 72 hours. But actually, we're finding out that that's not quite true. You know, there's actually evidence right now that. People training once a week, believe it or not, if the volume is the same, in other words, if I'm doing, you know, um, a total of 10 sets, regardless of what reps I'm doing, and I do that on one, through one session on a, in a week, not that I'd recommend that, but I'm just kind of illustrating the point here. 
or I spread that up over three sessions over the week, we see the the results are almost comparable, which means that we don't have to kill ourselves anymore in the gym by going every day to make sure that we're hitting, you know, people doing split routines that, you know, today's, you know, back and buys, and then it's this, and then it's that, it's this, you know, we can actually target a muscle group, you know, smartly once a week and you're going to see those improvements and also the embracing the reality like you said we're also not trying to become arnold and you know the fitness physique contestants we're just trying to preserve and maintain and maybe build a little bit of muscle mass right so that's the nice that's the first thing i would say which is kind of nice is that it's refreshing it's kind of been an adjustment for me because i've always lived by this mantra that you know you got to target a muscle every 48 to 72 hours and it's kind of a relearning i'm you know kind of retraining my mind to think differently that this is okay so I like that idea, right? The other thing that I found interesting in the research is some studies that have looked at variety, right? So, you know, we always have tried to manipulate, you know, the sets and the reps and the tempos and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that's actually shown to be pretty interesting is if you manipulate the variety of the exercises. So rather than just going into the gym and doing, you know, barbell bench press as your primary chest exercise, you know, and then maybe having an ancillary exercise, Mixing it up where, you know, maybe one time you do a barbell bench press, but then you do a um, uh, decline dumbbell or you do, you know, mix those exercises for those muscle groups. They actually found far better improvements. So this idea of variety, you know, some people have called it muscle confusion. You know, we've used that term, I think, a little, uh, we've overused it. But the idea is just being able to create some variety in the exercises you choose to do can also re lead to some greater results, Right. So I like those ideas right there. Now, the other thing that I, I think that we're not doing very well is I think, you know, um, drop down sets and doing, you know, uh, blood flow reduction, you know, it goes by many names. You know, we see the, BR, you know, um, BFR, we see reduced blood flow, vascular occlusion training. It has many different names. I think those are, I think, where we need to start looking at, and especially as we're getting older, because, you know, the traditional model for programming has always been about Take yourself through a set until you get to that point of fatigue or point of failure. I, I know they're different words. They're, they mean different things, but the word point of failure sometimes scares people. But we know what we're talking about, where you can't do another good rep, right? So we've always subscribed to that idea that, you know, push yourself in the set to point of failure, and then you're getting that overload you're looking for. Well, if you think about it, the muscle fibers that, that are most fatigable, and yes, they're the ones that have the greatest potential for growth, are the type 2B muscle fibers, your fast twitch muscle fibers, or at least one part of the type 2 uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. But what we generally ignored in training is that when we do a set, we a lot of times don't really overload our type 1s and our type 2A muscle fibers. And guess what? They're just as capable of growing. And so the idea has been we've always got to train heavy, right? Well, we have realizing we don't. If we can somehow provide the training stimulus to our type 1s and type 2As, they can also grow. And we might not have to kill ourselves in the gym doing that. So I think this is where the vascular occlusion training comes in, because by using this technique of a tourniquet of sorts or using drop down sets, two different types of training, we're effectively able to do our train with lighter loads, all right, maybe higher volumes. And yeah, blood flow reduction training is uncomfortable. Drop down sets aren't as uncomfortable. But we're finding that we're able to get a better training stimulus. Maybe I shouldn't say better, but we're getting a good or an optimal training stimulus as we would with traditional training. And yet we don't have to kind of really push ourselves to that exhausting limit where, you know, we wipe ourselves out and then we need, you know, we need that longer recovery. So I think as we're getting older, we need to think about aligned with this idea of training smart, like you've been alluding to, is Maybe we need to use more variety, maybe not tra training as frequently, and maybe we need to try different approaches to our set rep routines. And I think the two that I really are big fans of is using drop down sets and using, you know, uh, reduced blood flow training or blood flow re re reduction training. And there's tons of studies now supporting that showing, you know, they, they did one study where they actually used these tourniquets on older men who were quite old and they actually had them just walking. And they were gaining quad strength back, which means they were actually able to get themselves out of a chair without assistance. And so we're seeing, and you know, they've been doing this with cancer patients before they go into cancer, showing that they're able to come out of their, you know, chemo and not have lost as much muscle mass and they're able to, you know, be functionally independent. So I think we're on the tip of the iceberg. I think where this idea of blood flow reduction is going to go, I think is it's intriguing to me because I think we're going to discover a lot of wonderful things about it. And I think those are two good formats of training that people should give some thought to or at least consider utilizing in their 
regimens. Can you give example the drop down set? Yeah, so drop down set is a relatively simple idea, right? You know, you think about it is kind of you know the law of recruitment order. It's called the size principle. The way that we our muscles work. For example, let's say you're doing so, Debbie, you're doing a bicep curl, and you pick up a five pound dumbbell, right? Pretty light. So you don't need all your muscle fibers to do that work. So you actually utilize first your type one muscle fibers, which are the the more aerobic, smaller, weaker ones, right? And then if you change that out to a 20 pound dumbbell where you need a bit more force, you might realize that your type one mu muscle fibers are insufficient. So we need to recruit into the type two A's and then progress into the type two B's. So it's a kind of a tiered system that we always recruit type ones first, and then we go recruit type two A's and then type two B's, all right? And when we do a drop down set, the traditional set has always been, we train a set to the point of failure. Well, the, the type of fiber that's most fatigable is the type 2B because they're largely anaerobic. And so what we do is we exhaust that fiber. So great, that's a great stimulus for growth, but we really haven't provided the training stimulus optimally to the other two. So the idea of a drop-down set is you start off with that weight. So, you know, uh, generally we say, you know, until you kind of get to know your body a little bit more, target a point of failure. So let's just stick with that bicep. You're doing a bicep curl. So let's target on the first part of the set. So this is going to become a giant set, right? And this is the first set. So I'm going to call it set one, part A, part B, and part C. And you'll understand that in a second. Mm -hmm. So I might say, okay, Deb, here's what we're going to do. You got your dumbbells and you got pretty heavy dumbbells. And I want you to complete the first part of the set. Let's target six to eight, 12 reps to point of failure. And hopefully at that point we have overloaded and hopefully reach point of fatigue I'm sorry, point of failure with the type 2Bs. Then immediately what we do is we drop down some weight. Mm -hmm. We drop weight off. So we don't take a recovery. We strip weight off. So it's either change the dumbbells. If it's a pin, move the pin, whatever it might be. And you immediately go back into the second part of the set. So now you're at set part one, sorry, set one part B. And again, we go for a second point of failure. So now what we're doing is we're actually trying to simulate this maximal overload of the type 2A muscle fibers. And then immediately after we reach that point of failure, Again, six to 12 reps, if that's your target. We strip off some more weight and we jump into the third part of the set. So set one, part C. And now we go for point of failure with the type one muscle fiber. So now the set has been extended, right? So you've gone from maybe doing six to 12 reps and then taking recovery with six to 12 minimal recovery just to change the weight, six to 12 reps, minimal recovery, six to 12 reps. So this now could be upwards of a two minute set. And now you take your recovery. I'll give you 90 seconds to two minutes. All right. And we're going to repeat that maybe another two to three times. Right. Mm. But the idea here is how much weight you drop is really going to be dependent on you because we know your body's different from mine, which means your fiber composition, you're an ultra endurance athlete. So I'm going to guess that you have more type one muscle fibers than I do. Yeah. All right. So that's going to determine that within the muscles you have, if we're both training our biceps, you might have more type one muscle fibers than I do. All right. And we also know within the muscles, like for example, your gastroc is a muscle that's got a high concentration of type two muscle fibers, whereas your soleus has a high concentration of type ones because they're used for different purposes, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with your triceps. So you look at the lateral head versus the long head. Lateral head is a lot of type two muscle fibers. So how much weight you're going to drop between the sets is going to come down to you figuring out what works best for your body. So we're giving you this range. Hey, try and target point of failure within six to 12. And you might find that in one of those drops, you drop too much weight, which means in the subsequent part of the set, you did more than 12 reps. Well, what happens? You drop too much weight. So I would suggest on the next time around, don't drop as much weight Got it. or vice versa. You drop some weight, but you only manage to get to about four or five reps before you hit point of failure. In this case, I would tell you, you need to drop a little bit more weight. Now, hmm. this is the function of the muscle. Granted, there is a energy system involved here. So part of that burn that you're feeling may have nothing necessarily to do with the muscle fibers more to do with the metabolic acidosis that's accumulating. So we always have to, it's not a perfect system, but it is a system we try and work, you know, as to the best of our ability with the science that we have. But that's the idea of a drop down set. Mm -hmm. Makes sense to you? Yeah, I've done that. Now, women versus men, Stacey Sims, I've read her books and just, as I said, re listening to her Huberman lab and diving into all this stuff and trying to pick for the female athlete. She suggests doing more that as we get older, peri post menopause, we need that three to five rep count heavy weights to stimulate the muscle protein stimulus to, to grow muscle development. Is that 
Have you find any research on that one? Yeah, versus- because as we age, you know, we look at these two fibers, you know, we know that as we age, we suffer age-related loss in muscle mass, but there's actually, they're not, they're not losing at the proportional rates. The type two muscle fibers are lost at a faster rate. So it becomes more important to preserve strength because remember, heavy lifting is going to be able to target more of those type two muscle fibers. Like I mentioned, we always recruit the type ones first and then we go to type twos. So I'm not going to advocate doing heavy strength training all the time, but it definitely should be a part of your program, given the fact that we are losing strength and power at a faster rate than we say lose muscle endurance. So that's in in both men and women. It happens in both genders, right? Um, Obviously, a little slower rate of loss in men because they have some remnants of testosterone remaining, right? Mm -hmm. But it happens in both across both genders. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'm definitely going to advocate that, you know, they should be at least one session a week where you try and target a muscle, those primary muscle groups with some heavy load. It doesn't have to be every exercise. You can do an undulating model within your session. Like, let's say today you decide uh, it's a legs day and you could do, let's say you choose to do three exercises, you know, maybe do one of them very heavy, you know, with with heavier loads so that the strength emphasis is put there. Hell, it would be even great to do one with power, to have a power explosive emphasis there. And then you could do the third one with more of an endurance emphasis. So, you know, you mm-hmm. could do, you know, a heavy, uh, maybe you just decide I don't like to do squats because of my back. So maybe you're going to do a leg press heavy, right? Then you might say, how do you feel with doing, you know, um, maybe you, you, you enjoy cleans and I'll have you do just, you know, or maybe... A, a uh, what it's called a demo a demo lift which is like a half deadlift we can do those a little mm-hmm. explosively and then mm-hmm. maybe we go onto the leg the machines and we do a little bit lighter weight there for endurance if, on your leg extensions mm-hmm. leg curls you know biomechanically not the best machines but they are the machines we use yeah so interesting and then compare that to blood flow restrictive bands i have some v strong bands i was just I haven't been using, but I keep hearing more and more about it. And you kept talking about it. So yeah. I put them on and I have just a few weights here. And it was amazing <laughs> how yes. heavy my arms lifting five pounds were just noodles. But yeah. can you give a little bit more information on the blood flow restrictive band sure. protocols? I know I've read some, but what do you think? So, you know, the idea is, is relatively, you know, the, the, the rationale behind it is pretty straightforward and pretty consistent. The idea is we're going to use some sort of tourniquet. It should be at least an inch to two inches in, in diameter. Because if you start using thin bands, it kind of cuts into the tendon of the muscle and that can be uncomfortable. So we want to distribute that load over a larger surface area so that it's, un, it's not too uncomfortable. But the idea is we're going to use vascular occlusion. We want to get, you know, a good amount up to about 80% of what we call arterial, arterial um, flow occlusion. So that we have arterial blood coming in, but what we're doing is preventing venous blood from le- venous blood flow from leaving because arterial blood ar- arterial flow is under pressure, venous flow is not under pressure. So if we put a tourniquet on you, we can actually get blood to come in, but then it, not much of it leaves, and what ends up happening is blood starts to pool in that area, right? Well, certain things come out of that. Number one is we get hypoxic because you're not circulating oxygen in other systems. So Intentionally with, with reduced blood flow training or blood flow redu- re- re- restriction training, we are training with light weights. You're probably at about 20 to 50% of your maximal capacity of what you can do for that muscle. But what we're doing is high reps. So the format that I like is really adopted from Brad Schoenfeld, who's a great researcher in this mm-hmm. area. So his is basically, he talks about, you know, the first set is a burnout set. I mean, really get yourself in the hypoxic state. So it's really 30 reps. So I don't, I would say aim for 30, but if you can get somewhere between 20 and 30 reps, the intention of that first set is get that burnout, right? Get that muscle burn going. So you're truly hypoxic, right? Now, what we're going to do is take short recoveries and we're going to now continue our successive sets. You might be able to do a little bit more weight here because now we're going to drop the reps down to about 15. So I aim for 12 to 15. If you can hit 18, that'd be great. But 12 to 15 would be kind of a nice number to target. And we're going to do at least another three more sets, maybe even four. All right. So we're ending up with a total of about five sets. That would be as high as I would go. Some people advocate less. I mean, the research towards even two sets works well, but I, I, that's just my preference, right? I'd like to go the, the burnout set first and then the subsequent sets, whether it's two or three more, you know, I'm sorry, three or four more is going to be kind of in that 12 to 15 rep range. And because you could probably handle a little bit more weight, you might just, you know, move the pin one more or whatever weight you're doing. And, what we want to do is to make sure we keep that tourniquet on your arm. You know, I'd like to keep it on there for f- sort of five to 10 minutes at most. If you're going to do successive exercises, I'll let you take the tourniquet off for about a minute and then put it back on because it does get pretty uncomfortable. Okay. But the idea here is that we are kind of hacking the body because generally 
when we're training light, we don't recruit our big type two muscle fibers. But because we are hacking the system, how are we hacking? Is we're making you deficient of oxygen. And so our type two muscle fibers are anaerobic. So as we start to diminish the amount of available oxygen, we start to start recruiting into this type twos. And now we have what? What traditionally type twos can't do a lot of reps because they're very fatigable. But because we're training with lower intensities, we actually can get our type twos to work and do more reps because they're training at lighter loads. Now, another big important thing coming out of that is we're creating a lot of cellular swelling, right? We're creating a lot of, I mean, the muscle pump in there is huge. And cellular swelling is one of the theories that helps stimulate, you know, muscle growth. That's how bodybuilders work. I mean, that's what they thrive on, right? Let's do enough volume to get that muscle pump. Because over time, the muscle pump is one of the stimulus for muscle growth, right? It's what we call sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, which is how the bodybuilder grows. So we're kind of using that hack. Now, the other thing we see out of this is that we're seeing all sorts of other things happening that, you know, because there's a large amount of volume, there's also a significant amount of muscle damage, inflammatory responses. And now we're seeing also what's coming out of that is, I mean, the body adapts. We're saying, man, we need to put, not only build more muscle fiber, but we need to put more blood in here. So we see angiogenesis happening, even mitochondrial biogenesis. And that's where it becomes wonderful as we're aging, that yeah. we are bringing more blood and more mitochondria into that area, which means that muscle is going to remain viable and healthy. Because that's what we're losing with aging is we're losing mitochondria. And then with the loss of mitochondria, we don't need as much blood. Well, mm -hmm. that's, that's what this technique is doing is saying, it's part of the adaptations. We're not just going to grow the muscle. We're going to make more blood, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. create more capillaries to bring more blood in there. And we're going to create more mitochondria. And that's really, I think, where we see a lot of promise with this training technique is the applications it has beyond muscle hypertrophy. I think it goes into the longevity of the muscle cell. And I think that's going to be important to live with us as we go into our 70s and 80s and beyond. That's huge. I haven't heard the mitochondria part of that. That's fascinating. Yeah, mitochondrial biogenesis, yeah. Hmm. Now, when you're looking at a workout program, the ideal week for the aging individual, <laughs> athlete or non-athlete, do you look at how much time we should spend lifting weights versus the zone two we always make fun of, but to talk about and then hit training and sprint interval training? What is research saying for men and women they any suggestions or is it well personalized i, I think first first of all we got to this kind of dispel this whole myth of hit training right <laughs> what i'd say 95 percent of people do in the fitness industry what they're calling hit is not hit it's just high i know i've had like 20 hit, episodes on this <laughs> yeah hit training we know comes from sports performance with a simple goal bigger stronger faster that's why we use the word intensity to create the optimal overload but with, a, with, a, with that kind of overload, you need long recoveries. And the problem is that doesn't fit into most people's ideal of, wait, I want to burn calories in the gym. I don't want to be sitting on my butt. You know, you watch an athlete who's out there training, <clears throat> you know, they might be out there training for 30 minutes, but only done a handful of minutes of work because they spend a lot of time recovering so they can get optimal sets and reps, right? All right, so let's take put that aside. You know, we know HIIT training is this idea, whether it's the true HIIT training or this kind of pseudo HIIT that we see in the fitness industry, we know it's not a fad. We know that there's tons of research supporting that people can achieve a lot of their fitness goals, whether it is performance-based or health metrics in a compressed period of time when we do kind of, you know, high work rate type, you know, workouts. So given how precious of a commodity time is to us, I think HIIT training still has its place. I think it is a legitimate form of training. Well, theoretically, it all comes down to program design, but theoretically, it is a legitimate form of training where you can get the results you're looking for in a compressed period of time, which is important for us because we don't have to spend as much time in the gym, whether that's something you can do or just don't choose to do, right? I cannot do or don't choose to do. So I think it'll remain. I think we just need to find ways to use HIIT training more effectively. And so the, the, uh, the type of training I look at with HIIT training is if you plan to do this kind of high work rate interval-based training, which there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it goes to this idea, let's do it in a smart way rather than a hard way, right? Don't kill yourself. Like this whole idea of, you know, I'm going to go for 60 seconds, take a short recovery, and just go again and go again and go again. Then I look at what your reps look like in the subsequent sets and it looks like garbage. And if you're putting garbage in, you're only garbage out, which means you're increasing the likelihood of getting hurt. You are diminishing your recovery opportunities. You are also increasing your risk of injury. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, you know, concerns. So I always tell people, why don't we try some variations of interval training? There's tons of them out there. Like I talk about variable intensity interval training, variable interval training, variable recovery training, and variable modality training. You can keep the work rate high. Just be smart about it. In other words, 
If you're using a, a 40 pound kettlebell and you like to go short recoveries, then use a 40 pound, use a 40 pound. When you know that I'm dying on this set, what's my next set gonna look like? And it looks like garbage, flip it out. Go to a 10 pound kettlebell, slow down your tempo, keep working, but just slow down that tempo. And what it's actually doing is affording a little bit more recovery. So you can go back to the 40 pound kettlebell or shorten the interval. You don't have to go 60 seconds. Keep your recoveries there. Just modify the work interval from maybe 60 seconds down to 20 as needed, or take the recovery interval from 30 seconds to 90 seconds as needed, or change them down. You just busted your butt for six minutes. Let's go walk on the treadmill to do some zone two training, right? Mm -hmm. Let's alternate between aerobic and anaerobic work. These are smarter ways that we can get results in a time efficient way without killing ourselves. So yeah. I, I still believe that there's a very, there's a, there is a legitimate place for HIIT training. Now you mentioned HIIT training, and I mean, hit training versus, v, you know, uh, you know, zone two training, you know, just to clarify, zone two is a nebulous word because there's many different zone models out there. Um, i talk about zone two as being the area where we are working on your aerobic threshold. What we're doing is trying to improve your body's efficiency in terms of how it burns fuel, right? The fat burning. So, you know, we always look at in exercise at lower intensities, the body favors utilizing fat as a fuel versus carbohydrates for obvious reasons. We have an abundant supply of car uh, of fats. We have ample available of oxygen. We have a low demand for energy. But as exercise gets progressively harder, we undergo this little crossover. And that crossover is really where we mark, you know, to me is where I mark aerobic threshold. That's where you've gone from fat being your primary fuel to carbs being your primary fuel. So think of it as a 51, 49% flip over, right? You haven't gone to anaerobic. It's not your lactate, it's not, you know, anaerobic threshold or anything that happens much later, but I definitely see value in that because, you know, yes, we know that people say, well, can I increase my red blood cell count? Can I increase my mitochondrial, you know, density? Can I increase my, you know, my, my blood volume with high intensity training? The answer is yes to all of those, but it's this whole idea is where do we get the biggest bang for our buck? And you think about it, you know, the adaptations that we're looking for that I just mentioned, like mitochondrial biogenesis and stuff like that does happen with anaerobic training, but it also happens with aerobic training, right? And it could actually happen a little bit more efficiently because you're providing the optimal stimulus. So when you look at training programs of, of endurance athletes, you were one yourself. You didn't train the same way every day. You had mm -hmm. training days allocated to each of the zones. If you used a four zone yeah. model, you might've had a recovery day. You might've had an aerobic, you know, kind of, you know, an aerobic endurance day, which is building that zone two. You might have had your tempo run days where you're building your anaerobic threshold, and you might have had your power or hill days or sprint days where you're building mm -hmm. your anaerobic power. I really think at the end of the day, a training program should incorporate all zones. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to sit there and argue. I'm going to sit here and make the argument that I think this type of training is better than that kind of training. I think both of them are very good forms of training. Mm -hmm. I think you should include them both. And I think what I love about zone two training and zone one training is that if you've done a hit training on one day, it's a perfect type of training to do the next day to help your body recover. So mm -hmm. I like to have an undulation in those. So I definitely think zone two training has a lot of merit. All right. It may not be as time efficient to get to results as HIT training, but it has its place. It has its purpose and it has its value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we talk about that all the time. I laugh at it because as endurance athletes, we've been talking about this for 20 years or so. It's not anything new. And then suddenly Peter Atia and Huberman are acting like it's some new thing. And Absolutely. in our endurance world, it's like, wait a minute, mafetone has been doing the max aerobic function heart rate. We've been doing mm -hmm. metabolic testing forever. And yeah. it's, you know, we've been doing that yeah, already. Right you know, I mean, uh, you can even go back into the 1990s where, you know, uh, some of the researchers started looking at measuring, you know, like, how do we measure this? You know, when they discovered what it ha was happening there, creating the field test to actually measure it. I mean, this is stuff, this this information, much like, you know, I, I, I kind of marvel sometimes at the fitness industry because the science has been there for 20, 30 years, and then all of a sudden it becomes popularized, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a classic yes. example that we can cite here is Tabata training. Yeah. Right? Remember, it had its heyday in the around 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. maybe to 2012. But his research was done in 1996. So what happened for the better part of 14 years? It just lay there. And then I kind of marveled at it. I, mean, I look at the fitness industry. I'm like, what took you guys so long to figure this out? You know, and you're like, this is the latest trend. It's not a trend. The research has been there telling us someone just decided to implement it. And it's kind of gone viral in some form, shape or manner. But it's been there. And you're right. I mean, you look at, you know, Tim Noakes, the lure of running and, you know, all these marathon runners, they've been talking about these zones for years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. going back to the 1980s, I mean, that's nothing new. 
Yeah. I know. It's funny you just mentioned about the Tabata. You think that's from Japan, and so is blood flow restrictor bands, the Katsu bands. So the Japanese are kind of ahead of the game on longevity protocols and strength in a way. Um, you yeah. know, well, remember, so Katsu training, which is where reduced blood flow training started. I mean, that was actually conceived in the 1970s. Yeah. And it was really more rehabilitative. So it wasn't really designed for performance. It was more rehabilitation yeah. for injured muscles. And I think what's happened is when they saw the the, you know, the effect it had there, um, I guess what's come out of that is you know, hey, it may have opportunity for you know, for non-injured people too. And I think that's been more of the more recent surge in its popularity. But it, it was you know, it, it was pioneered you're right by the Japanese in the 1970s. So they, yeah, they have been pioneers in this type of research. But I think that's two key areas which, coincidentally, well, I don't know if it's coincidentally, but they are. Uh, aligning with longevity so maybe that you're onto something there i just but, thought of that yeah no it's 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 a it's a valid thought right there they've got the mega fatty acids the green tea they just know what they're doing over there the cooked well and you know they've, <laughs> they've done things right for so long you know they've always found that balance and that harmony in their lifestyle it's yeah. always been part of the japanese life and maybe that's you know and they've always had i mean look at their longevity they actually have some of the longest longevities in the world so maybe we should learn from them maybe there's something exactly that, we need to pay attention, more attention to. Yeah, I should talk to my Japanese friends about that. Okay, so that kind of goes into next topic is the recovery part. We talk about pre-nutrition for fueling for workouts is more performance, but then post-nutrition, post-workouts, a lot of thing talk about 30 minutes post-workout, we need to get the protein. And then we talk about quality protein and the leucine threshold, but men maybe can wait Two, three hours later, what's the best way to help recovery? You tell us. Science well, shows. You know, well, keep in mind, you know, I, I talk about the many R's of recovery. Recovery is more than just refueling and, you yeah. know, and, and resynthesis. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I talk about the rest, the recovery, the rehydration, the regeneration, the restoration, the replenishment. It's all these R's, right? And so the nutrition and hydration is one aspect of it. So if we just talk about that, I think I would start off with probably, and if I didn't say this, I'd be amiss. This, probably the most important thing I think that it needs to be addressed in recovery is not your protein, it's not your carbs, it's fluid, right? Mm -hmm. And the way to understand this is recognize that we can we we maintain water in two compartments in the body. We have what's called extracellular fluid, which would be water that's outside the cell, and that makes up a little under a you know a little over a third of our total body water, right? And sodium is the primary electrolyte in that. And then, of course, we have intracellular fluid that's inside the cell. That's what gives the cell its shape. It's where reactions take place in the cell. So extracellular fluid is your eyeballs. It's your saliva. It's your bloodstream. It's your spaces between the cells. It's all that. And the interstitial is inside the cell. And that's the other roughly two-thirds, right? A little less than two-thirds. Now, what happens is when we start to sweat, if you notice, your sweat has a lot of sodium in it. So sweat is salty. Because when we sweat, our sweat, a majority of it originates from the extracellular fluid, Right. And, but at some point we reach a threshold. We all have a unique threshold where the body says, listen, I don't want, I don't think I can afford to lose any more fluid from this extracellular compartment. So we actually start to borrow fluid from the intracellular compartment. We actually can move fluid. Fluid moves into the cell. That's the muscle pump. It can also move out of the cell when we're becoming dehydrated, right? Now you think about it, you've just finished a workout, you sweat profusely. And this is a big misnomer. People think if I didn't have a good sweat, I didn't have a good workout. It's actually the antithesis mm -hmm. of what's actually truth, truthful you actually want to minimize how much you sweat during a workout. Hmm. Because the more you sweat, the more fluid you're draining from your intracellular compartment. And that means it's going to take longer to recover because that hmm. fluid has to be put back. So actually, they talk about the, some of the best environments to exercise in are ones that are thermal neutral, where you're not sweating as much. You work out hard, but because the environment is cool, you don't have to sweat as much. Think about going for a run at 6 o'clock in the morning versus 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It could be I'm identical runs. Why do you sweat differently? It's got nothing to do with your effort. It's got to do with the environment. So if you can sweat in a cool environment, other thermal, thermal regulatory mechanisms work more effectively so you don't have to sweat. But let's get back to the sweating. When you're done sweating, let's assume the cell is dehydrated. Well, that's where you want muscle adaptation to take place. So think about a, a priority of a cell. Do you think a cell's priority is to restore homeostasis or to build you a little bit of muscle mass? Mm, homeostasis. Of course. Mm -hmm. So homeostasis is returning the cell back to its, its baseline. Well, that means it's got to get its fluid back in. And the problem is when you drink water, water doesn't just pass freely into the intracellular fluid. There's a process involved. It's got to do with concentration gradients, osmotic pressure, you know, hydrostatic pressure. There's a lot of physics involved in moving fluid. 
But the reality is rehydrating the intracellular fluid can take a little bit of time, right? At best, it may take a few hours. Hmm. At worst, it could take days, all right? Wow. So here's the catch, you know, that window that happens after you've done weight training where we seem to enjoy a significant, I'm not going to say the only, but a significant amount of muscle synthesis is that four to six hours post-exercise. But if you've got a dehydrated cell, you've got to think that cell is not going to be prioritizing muscle synthesis. It's going to be prioritizing the restoration of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. So probably the most overlooked thing is you've got to get your fluid back into your body and you've got to rehydrate strategically, which means water is a good thirst quencher, but it's not necessarily a good rehydrator because water has a passive movement through the body, right? And you're going to lose a lot to urine, right? And it's all based on, you know, fluid moves. And then we wait for establishing, we remove excess mm -hmm. fluid through urine, this is a slow process. Well, you might, that window of that four to six hour window might be closing on you. So the most important thing to do is go into exercise fully hydrated, be aggressive as you can during exercise to maintain hydration. It's probably inevitable. You're going to lose fluid because we can never replace fluid at the rate that we're capable of sweating. You know, a big male athlete could sweat, you know, two to three liters in an hour. So think of those little 500 mil bottles. Imagine yeah. during your run, trying to drink four to six of those every hour. It's impossible. We're right? throwing that up the whole time. Exactly, because your, your, your GI system is essentially shut down. The At least the mm -hmm. upper portion of the GI system is shut down. So it's inevitable you're going to lose fluid. But the idea is, you know, start off as high, you know, you hydrated, which means optimally hydrated, be as aggressive as you can. Obviously, we want to control the sweat rates as much as we can so that we don't lose as much fluid and then employ aggressive hydration strategies post-exercise. And the best thing to do is not to use water post-exercise, but to use kind of, you know, an electrolyte-based solution. It doesn't have to be Gatorade, but just an electrolyte-based solution because the electrolytes help preserve what's called osmotic pressure and that helps rehydrate the cells faster, right? Mm -hmm. And so the idea should be how much? Well, it's the simple way that I always tell people to do it is the, you know, old-fashioned way. To avoid it pre-weight before you exercise, to avoid it pre-weight, uh, post-weight after your exercise, dry, mm -hmm. right? And whatever that difference is, that's the amount of fluid that has to get into your body and stay in your body. Mm -hmm. but you're going to have to drink more than that because you're not going to keep it on your body because you're going to create urine, right? Kidney filtration rates, one to 1.5 mils per kg per, per, per hour. You're going to lose some of that fluid. So I would suggest that you should be planning to drink if it's an electrolyte solution, maybe into the range of 20 to 25% more than what you lost. Mm -hmm. So that's priority number one for me. I, that's mm -hmm. priority one. Then the protein is secondary for me. Now, protein, mm -hmm. we've also seen on studies, some interesting developments where taking protein one to three hours before your workout seems to be just as effective with muscle recovery as taking it right after your workout. Mm -hmm. So you can do both. You don't have to do one. I actually do both, right? I've seen no downside to doing both. And we also know that you should have multiple protein feedings through a day. Right. Studies have shown that feeding every three to four hours is good because it keeps you in what we call hyperinsulinemia and hyperaminoacidemia. It keeps amino acid levels high in the blood, keeps a little bit of insulin in the blood, and that helps pre uh, prevent muscle protein breakdown. Right. Mm -hmm. So feeding every three to four hours is a good idea. So if you can feed maybe one to two hours before your workout, go do your workout and then have something in the 30 minutes post exercise, you're bookending that workout beautifully. Mm -hmm. Now, we obviously want, like you've talked about, you've alluded to this idea of a leucine threshold. Yes, we want to make sure we're getting good quality protein. It's not just quantity, quality, and we need to make sure we've got enough leucine in there because leucine acts as kind of the linchpin, right? It helps activate the muscle building pathway of pathways, right? You know, can't do it on its own. It needs the other complement of amino acids, but it is the linchpin. So yes, we want to choose good sources of protein that have leucine in it, Right. But now the questions have come down to how much. And so we've seen this consensus. So there's a joint position statement from several researchers just, in fact, last year that said 0.25 to 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. So you got to do a little math conversion. That's 0.11 to 0.18 grams per pound. So take your weight in pounds, multiply by 0.11 to 0.18. It's going to put you in that 20 to 40 gram range, Right. It's a good dosing to have every time you take protein. So getting good quality protein that gives you that kind of dosing. But we just saw a study come out just recently that fed people 100 grams. And they compared it against 25 grams. And guess what they found? Because prior to that, we found that at 20, up to 20 grams, there was a significant increase in the rate of protein synthesis. But once you got to 20 grams, the difference between 20 and 40 was only about 10% difference in protein synthesis rates. But now this study that just came out 
gave people 100 grams and they found significant difference between the 25 and the 100 grams. So now it seems like, is there an upper limit to how much protein you can take in one sitting? We've always said, yeah, we should have an upper limit because you may not be able to assimilate it all, but we're finding that may not be the truth. So we don't know. But does that still need every three to four hours to stimulate the muscle protein? So you could get a hundred or 50 grams, but every three to four hours, is that still necessary? I would say that would be hyper, that would be excessive overdose of protein. There is going to always be an upper threshold for people in terms of how much protein can I assimilate into my body that gets converted to muscle? Because remember, mm -hmm. carbs can be stored as glycogen, fat gets stored as fat, protein, most of it is stored as tissue, Right. And yeah. so we need a mechanism that's going to convert. Well, your mechanism is limited. <laughs> Excuse me. The mechanism <laughs> is limited by your unique physiology, which is influenced by your age, your gender, hormones, everything. Mm -hmm. So eating more protein doesn't necessarily help. This was a study that looked at athletic individuals who had experienced you know, heavy weight training, and they were both fed two dosages. And they were looking at muscle protein synthesis for the following 48 hours. And they found that with these folks, and again, we can't take that knowledge and apply it to everyone, but with these individuals, they found increased rates of muscle protein synthesis. So what does that mean? If we like to feed every three to four hours, would I be giving you, you know, hundred grams every hour? No, not a chance in hell. I'd still stick with that 0.25 to 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight or that 0.11 to 0.18, which is, you know, I said 20 to 20, let's call it 20 to 25, up to 40 grams per meal. Maybe on a little higher side for guys, a little on the lower side for ladies, because, you don't need as much. You also have a smaller diameter GI tract for absorption. But is there the opportunity that if you decided in one meal, I'd like to take 70 grams, 100 grams, would that be a waste of protein? We're now yeah. saying no. In the past, we'd say, yeah, because we thought the upper threshold for men was around 50 and the upper threshold for women is around 30. Now we're saying maybe not. So I probably wouldn't do that every meal. But if you decided on, you know, you rehydrated properly and you decided you want to have a big bolus of protein, a big, you know, big intake of protein in one sitting and it took you upwards of 50, 60, 70 grams of protein, you might be just fine. Mm. We need to study this longer. We need to, this was a study yeah. published earlier this year. We need to get more studies like that, looking at this to see if this has universal application and is it just a one-time thing? Can this be done frequently through the day? There's a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Well, it kind of goes back to the Big discussion last, I don't know, five years or more about OMAD, eating one meal a day and trying to get all your protein in at one meal that like Sean Baker will have big, huge steak. And there's this, I forget, some other people that just have one big, huge meal. And then others that are like, oh, wait, we can't hit our protein goals if we are eating one meal a day. We need to have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then supplement to fill in the void of having essential amino acids and getting my goals that way versus I fasting and just doing one to two meals a day, I'm not going to hit that goal. Yeah, so, I think the consensus right now seems to be leaning in favor of multiple feedings through the day. So even those people that want to do some time restricted feeding where they do like a 16, eight, generally not well at, not well supported in the literature, because in one particular study, what they did is they gave all three, they had three, three groups, three, three test trials. And they're all given the same amount of whey protein. They're all given 80 grams of whey, of whey isolated protein. So good quality protein, but it was delivered in different ways. So one group was given two 40 gram servings, six hours apart. So they were looking at protein synthesis rates over a 12 hour period. So one group was given 40 grams, six hour interval, 40 grams, and that was it. Another group was given 20 grams every three hours. So they were 20 grams, three hour, 20 grams, three hour. And then the third group was given 10 grams every 90 minutes. So it was just the timing that was different. The amount of protein was the same. The timing was the difference, right? And what they discovered is that the first group, well, the last group that only had the small dosaging every 90 minutes didn't do very well because, as you know, this idea of a leucine threshold, there wasn't enough leucine in that that 10 gram serving to reach the leucine threshold. Because generally with the way I see it, you need somewhere in the range of about 12 to 15 grams of good way I see it to get at least two grams of leucine, right? And if you're a bigger male, you might need more than two grams. Now, the difference was the other two groups both exceeded the leucine threshold. So they both enjoyed a significantly higher rate of muscle protein synthesis. But the difference was the group that had four feedings enjoyed muscle protein synthesis bouts four times through the day as opposed to the other group that two days. And they weren't necessarily bigger. There was a minimal difference, but the other group ended up, the, the 20 gram group ended up with the 
most muscle growth because they had four bursts through the day in that 12 hour period where they ex enjoyed some muscle, you know, positive, what we call positive nitrogen balance. So the takeaway has been, that's where we've come up with this consensus that it's a good idea to feed every three to four hours. So when people are kind of getting their total quantity in one, one meal, is it as effective as taking that and distributing over several meals? The consensus seems to be right now, and who knows where we'll go, that distributing it over and prolong, you know, your waking hours is probably the better option today. I can't I can't speak for what we'll think tomorrow because you know the research will will challenge these con you know conventional ideas right now that or these consensus consensual ideas we have right now and we may discover something different. Yeah, so I always have to keep on it, but that sounds similar to what is that Donald Dr. Donald Lehman's studies in their group? They seem to be talking yeah. about the protein distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so last a little bit. This is a whole hour conversation, but sure, I did no want problem. to touch on the. Well, let's summarize your the recovery R's, and then we'll. I want to touch on GLP one. What so, were the R's? The all oh, R's? there's there's a ton of R's. Here's here's what I you know, you've heard this before, and I'm sure you did this when you were in your training. Listen to your body, right? So I you know in this time and age where we have all this amazing technology, yeah. you know, I still like to sometimes go back to simple you know simple ideas, and you know, what I think people need to do is you know, realize that we can train hard, but are you allowing or affording your body the opportunity to recover? And the biggest challenge I have is that most people ignore what their body's telling them. So mm -hmm. I, I choose three things, right? I teach people real simple. I'm like, you can use fancy technology, but this is something that you don't even need technology to do. I teach you how to do a 30 second resting heart rate first thing in the morning, waking up naturally, know your 30 second count, because we know exactly what's happening with, with, physiological improvements that resting heart rate comes down with the, you know, any undue stress, overtraining, getting sick, your resting heart rate is going to go up. So know your number. Second thing I do is I do a heart rate variability count. So I just have you find your radio pulse and we're not going to count anything. We're just going to pay attention to the rhythm because we know that when you have what's called normal sinus arrhythmias, which means your heart rate fluctuates as you breathe in, your heart rate speeds up. And as you breathe out, your heart rate slows down. We're not counting numbers. We're just paying attention to the tempo, the, the rhythm. And if you have a normal rhythm, in other words, you see these fluctuations where it seems to be speeding up and slowing down, that's a healthy sign, right? If we don't see that, if it seems to be pretty consistent between your breathing and it doesn't change, that's an unhealthy sign. So this test is done first thing in the morning when you're supposed to be in your most recovered state. I do a 30 second resting heart rate. I do a 30 second heart rate variability. So there's a minute, right? And then I do what's called a controlled pause test. Controlled pause test is a breathing test just to decide to determine whether you are someone who's an overbreather. Overbreathers are shallow, rapid breathers. Think of a wounded animal. You don't ventilate very well. So mm -hmm. we have, because we carry a lot of stress, have unbeknownst to ourselves, a lot of us are overbreathing. We breathe not to the degree, I'm exaggerating as the wounded animal, but we're breathing like that. And that's why we talk about, you know, when you're stressed, deep, slow breaths, like a box four, 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 four. We talk about flow breathing. You know, Huberman talks about his side breathing. I mean, there's all these techniques, right, about how to breathe where we can slow down your tempo because you can ventilate more efficiently. And so there's a control post test and we don't have the time to really teach you, but you know, mm -hmm. this was created by a Ukrainian uh, uh, physiologist many, many years ago for asthmatics, but we take that concept and we do simple breathing test. And that's a minute test we do. So now in two minutes, when you wake up in the morning, you can do these three manual tests just lying in bed and it gives you insight as to what today should look like. If those tests are all green flat, they're all coming out green light, green light, green light, Go do your hit workout today. Go do your uh, your butt kicker. But if they're coming back and they're showing a little bit of red flags or, you know, like your resting heart rate's a little high, you don't seem to have that much variability. Maybe your control pores, you're a little over breathing. Then make today a restorative day. Mm -hmm. So I talk about having being very fluid with your recovery, that you shouldn't have a fixed schedule because, you know, your body is not just recovering from the stress of the workout. It's the stress of everything in your life and the body needs that recovery. And we don't know if you had a good night's sleep or not. So everything should be contingent about how you've recovered and you plan your day accordingly. And I think that's the one of the most important takeaways about the R's. With all the R's out there, it comes down to one thing, listen to your body. So yeah. look for the results that those three tests give you and use that to decide whether you can, you need a restorative day or not. That's kind of yeah. you know one big takeaway I would probably add to this whole thing of recovery. I love that. I, I do that with my coaching clients. I do, you know, look at all their metrics on training peaks and yeah. look at their nutrition and their 
heart rate variability scores in their resting heart rate. And it's fascinating correlating that with people that have a lot of stress and anxiety and how it wasn't necessarily their exercise that causes stress and drop their HIV is alcohol is the most people, their alcohol intake. That and if they had a lot of stress the day before and just life work or anxiety. Sleep. Or I mean, something, it's sleep it's hygiene. Just... There's a whole bunch of things. I mean, yeah. you know, and so they all have to be considered, but you know, everything has to be looked at, especially to get older as kind of, you know, they all integrate into this concept of, of wellness, right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, what it I is. love it. Yeah. Okay, so just anything we can share, and I will try to do some follow-up podcasts on this topic, but GLP-1 was a big topic at the Idea oh. Fitness Convention because we as, as fitness trainers and I'm a health practitioner really look at holistic health and how this is a growing area and any insight on GLP-1 and how we can work with the strength training Absolutely. part of it we talked about. I think I think we'd be, you know, as fitness professionals, we need to understand what these these drugs are doing. And kind of like I shared with you at that session, I talked about this is not a fad either. We talk about the projections of where this is going to go. I mean, to a point where they're estimating by 2030 that we're going to have, you know, 30 million American adults taking some form of this type of drug. I mean, that's, it's just boggles the mind, right? And we get it because the, the, the studies have shown impressive results. I shared that study, the big STEM study, where... You know, they took a control group who had some behavioral interventions and they took the Ozempic group, you know, and they did a 16 week ramp up to that dose, which is 10 times usually what a diabetic takes. And they saw very impressive weight loss over the trial, the treatment of 68 weeks. So 16 week ramp up, 52 week study. But what the problem was is what happened afterwards when they got them off the treatment. What happened was the the GLP group, they, they got a significant amount of their weight back, right? But what unfortunately happened, even though they ended up with a net loss, they also had a significant change in their body composition and for the worse, right? So I left you, when we were having that, that session, I left you with kind of six kind of important takeaways. You know, when you consider the research studies that are being done out there and we start looking at, you know, kind of, hey, what can we do if I'm working with a, you know, a client who's taking, you know, these types of meds, you know? I think we can help them. So number one, I would say, you know, I'll just recap the six kind of takeaways here. Number one is as a trainer, coach, whatever you are, work within the constructs of the medical team. So make sure you are communicating. If they have a doctor, dietitian, what are we doing here? Because I'm very worried about low, pro, uh, low energy availability, right? Because we know that with these Zempic, these folks are not eating, their appetites are suppressed, right? And then they're still trying to exercise, and, you know, we know that the human body needs a certain amount of calories to maintain its physiology. So the there's an equation for low energy availability where we take your total energy intake, from that we subtract your exercise calories and we divide it by your lean body mass in kilograms and we get a numerical score, right? And the reality is a lot of these people that are on these drugs are way under what's considered to be optimal in that score, which is concerning because now they're attacking muscle protein. They're wasting away muscle protein because they're technically their body's starving, Right. So I would say work within the constructs of the medical team. So make sure if there's a dietitian involved, there's, there's ongoing communication. That would be the first thing. Second thing we know is that, you know, we know studies show that if we are helping people lose weight and they're losing weight pretty drastically, if we give them more protein in their diet, it can help offset some of that loss of or that muscle catabolism that happens. So I was going to say we want to augment the diet with more protein, right? This has been demonstrated in all weight loss studies, not just GLP ones. So we don't really have specific guidelines, but the idea is around, you know, 1.4 to 2.0 grams per kilogram of body weight, right? So for every, what does that count, translate to for me, in, in pounds? It's about 0.64 to 0.91 grams per pound, right? So what we want to do is to make sure that during this process, you are getting more protein in your diet, right? Third thing we got to do is we got to get you into resistance training. So you've got to become a strong advocate for resistance training and now subscribing to that overload where we are trying to actively build or preserve muscle mass, right? So we've got to have those three things in there. And then of course, the next things we look for is, you know, during the process, right? You know, studies show that while people were going through the treatment, you know, using different types of behavioral interventions didn't seem to change the outcome very much. People all still lost consistently about the same amount of weight. But what happens is the rebound that happens after the treatment stops. And this is where we've got to get into our behavioral coaching during the treatment. So whatever treatment they're on, you know, three months, four months, six months, this is when you have the opportunity to really lay the foundation to get them, you know, whether it's qualitative approaches like mindful eating, intuitive eating, maybe teaching them portion sizes, whatever tools and applications you want to utilize, this is the time to do it so that you prepare them for what's going to happen afterwards. Because when their appetite comes back, if you haven't laid this foundation, 
they're just going to yo-yo and bounce right back, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to be worse off because they they got to put the weight back on, but they lost muscle mass. So they're going to be worse off than where they started. So this is the opportunity. And I'm really big on you know intuitive eating. Listen to your body, the hunger scale, yeah. appetite, because that's where GLPs really have the effect. They can actually slow down gastric emptying, and that can actually result in this food being eaten. But it also has an effect on the associations we're making in our brain with certain foods, the satiety that we get from certain foods, and especially with chocolates, alcohol, and sweets. Well, we want to strengthen that resolve before they get off of it. If not, they just resort back to temp, you know, those temptations of eating things. So the behavioral coaching becomes a critical part during the treatment. And then the last two is periodic body composition analysis. We've got to monitor that what they're losing is weight, but it's fat mass, not muscle mass. So we've got to make sure that maybe every six to eight weeks, we're doing a body comp a valid body composition analysis just to make sure that we're on plan here. And then the last one is what you really alluded to. I don't think any intervention happens without some some awareness of and in, interventions that deal with stress management. There has to be something along that because we know what chronic stress can do. You know, with chronic stress related to appetite, to you know, comfort foods, everything. I mean, that just destroys what physically the GLP one drugs are doing can be can be kind of written out or just be you know over, uh, trumped or overruled by you know the effect of cortisol and what it does in terms of psychologically you handling handling stress through comfort right yeah so i think we have to get into that you know that stress management that's the sixth thing so those are kind of the you know work with the medical confines of the medical team augment the protein intake get into resistance training get into behavioral coaching uh, body composition analysis and stress management i think if you get those six things done you can attend to those six things you are definitely doing a great service to your glp1 clients or you know patients whoever you're working with yeah, I love that. I just think it's such an important area to help those people that are doing that for obesity reasons, not just the five, 10 pound weight loss people, yeah. but the health reasons that people are doing it for the behavior modification part and learning the new relationship to food and how to exercise. And, you know, that was a big conversation at the fitness convention that a lot of those people feel uncomfortable, insecure, and not going to the gym already because they're very obese. And so how we can support those new exercise habits and movement and mobility and really support them along that journey. So we help them in creating their ideal future self as well as what we're trying to do. To be yeah. our best self, live our I mean, best life. Know, and for a lot of these folks, you know, you think about it, they, they, you know, if they are tackling obesity or dealing with, uh, they may have an unhealthy relationship with food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and we shouldn't, food is just a, food should just be viewed as a means to provide nourishment to the body. Food is not designed to be something to help you cope with emotional duress, you know, s stressful thoughts. That's not what food is designed to be, but unfortunately we've developed those relationships. So this is the perfect time as people are, you know, learning to control what they're eating because of the effect of the medication. This is a perfect time to revisit, you know, any irrational you know, thoughts and emotions that are associated with food and to, you know, kind of, you know, correct them so that mm -hmm. we just see food as a source of nourishment. You know, we are going to be more intuitive eaters. We're going to be more mindful eaters, you know, helping them with portion control, learning to listen intrinsically to, mm -hmm. you know, when I feel pleasantly full, stop eating. I don't have to keep eating what's on the plate, learning them how to manage their portion sizes. I mean, there's so much that we can teach them during this time that at the tail end, when they get off the treatment, that just sets them up for success rather than failure. Yeah. Yeah. I think there should be hopefully more of that in the future in programming with integrative approach so we can be more involved in people's longevity, health, and happiness. Yep. All right. So I know I want to give you back the rest of your day. Where can people find you? What if I want to go back to college and take your classes? <laughs> well, San Diego State, obviously. Uh, you know, <clears throat> I occasionally, I occasionally post. You know, I put articles like you. I think you saw my GLP one articles. I'll, I'll occasionally post them on social media, on Facebook and stuff. But what really my focus is right now is, you know, yes, I present. I present at a lot of different conferences. But what I'm focusing right now is, I've got a ton of content that I've created for my classes at university, and I'm converting them into handbooks. Wow. Oh, right. Good. And so my first two are kind of we're in post editing right now. So the first one is just principles of nutritional science, and the second one is going to be nutritional mm -hmm. coaching. And they're just going to be just real small little handbooks, six by nine handbooks that fitness and health professionals can keep with them. And it's just quick reference guides to, mm -hmm. you know, just the principles of nutritional science and nutritional coaching. And then I'll do exercise physiology. I'll do kinesiology. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to do um, uh, sports nutrition. I'm going to just do various topics that I, you know, kind of are in my wheelhouse and that I teach. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have the aging, you know, uh, you know, coaching the aging athlete or the aging person. These are kind of my goal for the next. I've got an agenda for the next. I'm committed to a seven a seven book series contract. Ooh. And so I've got to do over the next three and a half to four years. That's my goal. So the first two that's are great. getting close, probably be getting released. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll share my space on Facebook. And again, I'm going to try and get, you know, Amazon's doing my publishing. I'm going to, you know, they've required me to, you know, they have a mandate as to kind of a markup, but I'm trying to keep them as affordable. Yeah. I just want to put them out there. And if it helps someone as a resource, that's, you know, go grab it. And that's going to be kind of, you know, what my focus is going to be in the next few years. So that's where you can find me is look for those pan books coming out. And hopefully they're, I'm calling them handbook series, right? Just useful resources <laughs> that the practitioners can access to get answers. Hopefully, and I, I can't promise all the answers, but some answers. Well, you're so filled with knowledge. And I just wish I could go back to college and have a professor as you, just so wise and up to date and research. Yeah, it's, just, kind. it's so amazing to have. I'm sure college kids, do they appreciate you? <laughs> just knowing that you don't learn. This I don't stuff know. Other places? No, I, I know I can't please everyone. So some, some like me, some, I'm sure some hate me too. So it is just, you know, it's the nature, the nature of being a teacher, right? Yeah, right. I know. Well, keep it up. And I, I'm sure, do we get NASM credits for those books? Uh, no, because these are, I'm doing these on my own, so these won't be published through anything. Well, you know, we'll talk to NASM down the road, see if they want to borrow some, but no, I, I, right now these are being published independent of NASM. Oh, amazing. Well, keep it up and we'll follow you to get info on when those books come out and I'll share that. And thank you so much for a little touch on how we can improve the aging oh, process. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate you having me on your podcast.